Hello and good evening and welcome to the third, well I say good evening, it's eight o'clock in Jerusalem, but it's a pleasure to have people joining us from all over the world for the third in a series of events um, celebrating the art of translation. As Aviva said, I'm Akin Ojai and I'm co-editor of the Tel Aviv Review of Books. And over the five Sundays of August, the Tel Aviv Review of Books and the National Library of Israel will be hosting some of Israel's leading in translators in conversation, giving them an opportunity to gain insights into their work and into their relationship with the Hebrew language. This week, it's an absolute pleasure to have here with me, virtually, of course, Haim Watzman. Um, Haim has, over in a career stretching back more than a quarter of a century, Haim has rendered into impeccable English prose the work of some of Israel's leading nonfiction writers, including Tom Segev, Yuval Noah Harari, Tamar El On, Menachem Klein, and Igal Sana. For many years, Haim was an Israel correspondent of the Chronicle of Higher Education, and he's also written two works of nonfiction, Company C, An American Life as a Citizen Soldier, and A Crack in the Earth, A Journey Up Israel's Rift Valley. Haim is also the author of more than 150 necessary stories, observations in a variety of styles about Jewish and Israeli life. 24 of these are collected in a volume going under the same title, and some have been adapted for the, for the theatre, and as I hope we'll have a chance to talk about later on this evening, um, um, some are actually in the process of being translated at the moment. Haim, Good evening and welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Akim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. First place, congratulations to the National Library and, and uh, Tel Aviv Review of Books for, for doing the series. Um, translators are generally um, forgotten, and nonfiction translators are forgotten even when translators get mentioned. So I was very gratifying to, uh, to be asked to participate uh, with such a, a fine panel of uh, uh, of other translators. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you. The pleasure is all ours. Thank you very much. Let's start off with the title for the evening's event, Translating the Nabokov Shadow. Um, that's a title for an essay, derives an, an essay that you wrote about to work of nonfiction translator. And incidentally, the essay can be read in full on Hiram's website, southjerusalem.com. And I'll print, I'll be posting a link in the chat facility in a moment. Um, if you say you talked about Nabokov, who of course was one of the pro stylists of the 20th century, and his perhaps contradictory approach or considerations about translation, at the same time suggesting that the translator owes his fidelity to the author, or then also acknowledging that circumstances may well arise where the translator's awareness of the target language may very well supersede authorial intent. Um, in this, you say specifically, a translator cannot assume simply because a writer chose a certain string of words in his native language, that he would have chosen the literal equivalent of those words had he been writing in some other language. Could you expand a bit on that? It's a very interesting and perhaps not immediately obvious observation. Yeah. So. I mean, this is a subject about which there is, of course, a lot of uh, discussion and disagreement among translators and among literary scholars about what the object of translation is. Uh, is it to render the work? Uh, Nabokov himself um, wrote, uh, translated uh, works from uh, Russian into, into English, including some of his own novels that he had written in Russian. And he was adamant that uh, that a translation should re reproduce all the um, awkwardness and uh, and bad writing of the original. He said Dostoevsky was a horrible writer, and that any translation that tried to make it look otherwise was uh, was not a good translation. Um, uh, but the fact is that he didn't follow his own rule uh, all the time, especially when not translating his own work, and. Uh, and uh, in one of his novels, he has a, um, a translator who's a character. The novel is called Ben Sinister. And 
uh, and at one point the translator in the novel makes a tells a parable or an, makes an analogy that I very much like. Even though Nabokov in the in the novel, um, in the context, it's it's obvious that the author or the or the narrator doesn't think that this is a good uh, analogy for translation, but I think it's very good. Uh, he he tells of a sculptor. A sculptor leaves his studio and goes out into the forest. And in the forest, he encounters a tree and the tree casts a shadow that uh, in the, the sculptor thinks is the uh, most beautiful thing he's ever seen. And he goes back to his studio and he sculpts a sculpture that doesn't look anything like the tree, but which casts the same shadow. And, um, and I think what the I think what that means is, in other words, that the the translation is not going to look anything like the original. It's yes. in a different language. It's uh, it's got uh, different cadences. It's got different vocabulary, um, but it makes the same impression on the reader. Mm. I think it's a very apt to have put in it. Indeed, it it captures the essence, not necessarily replicating um, faithfully. Well, it does replicate it faithfully, but it's not in the same style, not in the same words. But he leaves the same impression. Um, let's think about Hebrew as a language. Um, now, as an expressive language, Hebrew differs from English in quite a number of ways. Um, how does this influence the act of rendering a text that was originally written in Hebrew into English? Uh, well, Hebrew, Hebrew is very different from English. Uh, I love both languages very much. Um, uh, but there are a number of differences that that are, are matters of the structure of the language and there are matters of what's accepted style in each uh, language. Um, for example, English, uh, Hebrew, because it takes fewer words to say uh, the same thing that it does in English. English translations are usually in the area of 35% longer than the Hebrew text in terms of number of words. Um, so a, uh, a Hebrew sentence that sounds very long and flowing if you try to reproduce it uh, exactly in English, it's, it will often sound distended and incomprehensible. And um, uh, another problem is uh, uh, incomprehensible sometimes, not just because of the length, but because, um, because Hebrew has gender markers for verbs and nouns that sometimes make it easier to parse the sentence and understand what, what is referring to what uh, that makes it possible to write a longer sentence. Um, on top of that, simply, simply uh, modern style in both languages tends to differ. Uh, in, in English, there's, there's more of a, uh, an admiration for shorter sentences, for subject verb sentences. I, I'm the son of a, my father was a journalist and that's how I learned to write, you know, short sentences, subject verb. Uh, Hebrew, accepted Hebrew style today, you know, what's considered, what is considered beautiful, a beautiful Hebrew sentence tends to be uh, longer and, and more, more complex uh, in structure. Um, so the idea is to, the idea is to reproduce in English something that uh, reflects the author's style, but isn't identical to it. So for example, a long Hebrew sentence will often have to be brought uh, broken up into two or three English sentences. Now, those English sentences will sound long and flowing in English um, in the same way that that original sentence sounded long and flowing in Hebrew, uh, but it'll be a shorter sentence and it'll be, the idea will be expressed in more than one sentence. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's one issue. Another issue is that the semantic range of words differs as it does in every language. Uh, each word has a semantic range. It has a certain range of meanings that um, uh, that, uh, that it, it brings to mind in people who uh, know the language. Uh, but those are, those are not identical except in very, very simple words. And so often um, an author will make a stylistic choice to use, to repeat a certain word um, uh, in, in Hebrew but that can't always be reproduced in English because the different contexts in English require the use of different words or vice versa. The, uh, where a Hebrew writer uses uh, different words, it might be necessary in English to use the same word. 
And then there's another thing that's an aesthetic um, on the aesthetic side is that in Hebrew, it's considered actually good style to repeat words. Whereas in English, it's generally considered better style not to repeat words, but to use alternatives and synonyms. And that's just, a, that's just an aesthetic pre preference that's been established in both languages that you would need to take into account. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, so now, in the place of a translator, you've come to a place where you've determined that you can think of a better form of words for the author in place of what the author's originally said. How do you, what sort of thought process goes through your mind? How do you address the actual task of reconfiguring what it says and what sort of endpoints do you have in mind? So, um, uh, the obviously, I, I work with different kinds of authors. I, first place I work, while I work primarily with nonfiction, I have occasionally done fiction and even poetry. Um, and of course, each each genre requires its own its own set of skills and its own uh, sensitivities. Um, uh, even within the nonfiction range, there's a there's a distinction between uh, between authors I work with who are fine writers and have uh, are very attentive to their style. For instance, Tom Segev and uh, and uh, David Grossman, or a journalist like Nadav Ayal, whose um, whose book uh, just came out. Uh, yeah. The, the revolt against globalization. Yes. Uh, so, so these are writers where I need to uh, I need to be very very uh, considerate of their style because they're very deliberate in what they're in their doing and they and uh, they they want to tell their stories in a certain way. Uh, then I need to find an English equivalent for uh, for their style and try to and try to create a style in English that creates that same shadow that, as. Uh -huh. a, um, I, but a lot of the authors I work with are scholars, um, especially young scholars. And the main goal here is to get their points across. Um, getting the meaning across, getting around, across the, the, the message that they want to convey and, the, and the, um, the, the material that they have plumbed and that they are analyzing is, is of primary importance. And here I'm... Uh, uh, I'm not as respectful of their style because most of them, most of them acknowledge that they need some help in getting their in getting those ideas across. Uh, and uh, the hardest people, the hardest ones are to work with are the occasional. There's not very often, but occasionally there's an author who thinks they're a great stylist, and at least in my humble opinion, they're not. And then then things can get a little complicated. Uh huh. Right, very interesting. Um, I noticed that you mentioned that your father was a journalist. Um, and that touches on my next question, which is about the formative experiences of a person who has become a translator. Um, you were born in the United States in 1956. You grew up in Silver Spring, um, Maryland, and you went to Duke University, took your degree, and you made that there to Israel um, in 1978, almost immediately after completing your degree, I imagine. Um, what formative experiences did you go through in childhood that brought you, other than having a father who was a pro stylist as a journalist, that might have made the work of a, of a, of a translator appealing to you? Um, I had no idea that I would become a translator. That wasn't part of the problem. I had no idea that I was going to stay in Israel. I thought I was coming for a year to do volunteer work in a development town and, and then... Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, well, plans of way of changing, it seems. But um, I did get caught up with the language, was caught my interest very early on. I mean, I had some Hebrew background from, I, uh, unlike most American kids, I, I continued after my bar mitzvah and after my confirmation in a, in a high school program. Uh, and so I had, uh, I, I didn't have much of a vocabulary, but I had a fairly good grasp with grammar and and stuff so that when I came to Israel, I, I was able to progress relatively quickly. But uh -huh. I also, uh, also being the son of a journalist, uh, <laughs> I guess, um, I, I just was very self-disciplined. And uh, during my first year in Israel, I, um, I just 
I just made myself a rule that I wasn't allowed to read an English newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was a daily uh, voweled Hebrew newspaper, a little newspaper called Omer uh, that I subscribed to. And I used to read every day. And because I needed to get my news every day, I would spend uh, you know, an hour or two with, the, with that little newspaper and a dictionary trying to puzzle things out. And, um, and then when I decided to stay on, I started taking courses with the Open University, which forced me to, uh, to read more sophisticated texts and also to write because I had to hand in assignments. Right. Uh, so, um, and then when I went into, when I went to the army, when I was in basic training, I made myself a rule that I would only read in books in Hebrew. Uh -huh. uh, and then when I got out, uh, when I finished basic training after six months, I let myself read a book in English after six months. And it was like, it was like such a liberating feeling. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like it's very disciplined. I mean, I've made a rule for myself several times in the 15 years I've lived in Israel and I keep on breaking it at um, slowly but surely. Um, I think you had quite a number of interesting experiences at university, which you hinted at, which actually shaped your engagement with Israel. Um, I believe you were active in Hillel, and this was in the mid-1970s, and at the height of what I suppose could be described as anti-Israeli sentiment of a period. Could you say a little bit about that, and how that might have shaped your decision to come to Israel? Uh, okay, well, that's a story I tell in, the, in Company C in my first book. Uh, uh -huh. Um, but, but yeah, I, I did not, unlike most of my friends, I did not, um, I didn't, my, my house was very Jewish. We were, you know, we went to a conservative synagogue. We were sort of observant in some ways and not in others. And, and, uh, um, but my parents weren't actually actively involved in Zionist groups and I didn't belong to Young Judea or Habonim or the other youth groups that my friends belonged to. And I didn't make the the, the high school trip to Israel that most of my friends uh, made. Um, I didn't, um, it wasn't really on my compass. Uh, Israel was there, you supported it because you were Jewish and that was about as far as I knew, you know, and Israel was always right and the Arabs were always wrong and that was, that was as much as I knew. And um, uh, in 1976, when I was at Duke, the UN passed the, um, Zionism's racism issue and we had a Duke was not a very Jewish place we had a very small group there and the Hillel director said we should get up a petition against it and I sat on the quads uh, during my you know during my turn to get people to sign and uh, uh, a Jewish guy from one of my classes came by and he refused to sign it and I said why and he said well Zionism is racism it's only for Jews and I sort of never thought about it before and I he just threw me into a all of a sudden I started thinking about Israel and I started for the first time reading about Israel and I became very anti-Zionist at first. I was convinced he was, he was right. And, uh, and it was a big, it was a big crisis because I discovered that I'd sort of been lied to in Hebrew school uh, that, and by my parents about this, that there, the, the, there were lots of problems in Israel. Israel had, wasn't always right maybe, and the Arabs weren't always wrong. And the, anyway, um, and then the Hillel director, who was very smart, instead of screaming and yelling at me, he said, you should go to Israel yourself and, and see for yourself. And um, to make a long story short, I, I did go for a three-week trip. Uh, there wasn't birthright back then, but it was sort of the same kind of thing sponsored by the Jewish agency. And I was here for three weeks. Uh, I did the usual tour, and I had time to, to wander around and talk to Arabs and Jews. This was just after the, after the Likud came to power. And I realized that, um, that things were a lot more complicated than I realized. Mm -hmm. And I also heard about a program called Shrut Lam. I'd been planning to go to the Peace Corps after, after college. And I uh. heard about this possibility of, of volunteering in, uh, in Israel. And I figured, so why not? I'll, I'll learn Hebrew instead of whatever. And, um, and, uh, and I came and I volunteered in a development town in Hatzor Glilit. Um, which was unlike all my friends who had been here, who'd all been on kibbutzim or at one of the universities, I saw really the underbelly of Israeli society, uh, the people who'd been left behind and forgotten and who were suffering from crime and delinquency and, and unemployment. And basically I decided that the country was so screwed up that if I went home, I couldn't possibly defend it. So I had to stay here and try to 
do something to make things better. But, so that's what I've been trying to do. For, uh, and the best part of 40 years of AT are still here. I asked a question because I think that it gives a sense of factors beyond the formal education that or formal experiences that a translator brings to the work, understanding and engaging the context of a place, and indeed engaging and understanding the context of a place that they've come from as well. Um, I believe your first work, your first commissioned book for translation was David Grossman's The Yellow Wind. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came about this um, commission? So, so again, this is like everything in my life is like totally by chance. I, I, I had started working as a freelance journalist. That's what I knew how to do. And I had gotten a couple connections with the Chronicle of Higher Education and a couple other newspapers. Um, and then I met Ilana and, and we got married. Life, yes. <laughs> and we had uh, kids on the way. And Ilana said, listen, this isn't enough money. We can't raise a family with this income. And I was sort of, you know, clueless. I said, oh, really? You know, so I said, you know, I have to find something else to do. So a friend said, you know, you could translate. Uh, Jeff Green, who's a wonderful translator in his own right, said, uh, we go to the same synagogue. And he said, why don't you try some translation? And um, that got me connected with Deborah Harris, the agent. And she called me one day and she said, listen, there's this, uh, there's this young writer named David Grossman. And... Um, there was a magazine back then called Kotorat Rashid that Tom Segev actually was editor of. Um, uh, it was sort of like an attempt to do like an Israeli New Republic or something like that. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they commissioned Grossman to, to spend um, a couple months just going around the territories and writing about it. And then they, they devoted an entire issue to his experiences, to his, uh, and uh, they, uh, and Deborah says, listen, we have to get, um, we have to get, two chapters of this translated immediately because we're sending it to the New Yorker and we're hoping that they'll, they'll pick it up and that'll be a, you know, the opening to translating the entire book. Yes. And I was scheduled to go to Miluim uh, a few days from then. Reserve, reserve army, army service, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so uh, reserve duty, right, in, in Hebron. And so I, um, um, I sat down and of course, what did I have back then? I had a manual typewriter. I didn't have a computer. <laughs> Um, I uh, translated the two chapters very quickly without really even having time to go over it mm -hmm. uh, and went off to Miluim and uh, spent the month in Hebron during which my, my older son was born. And, um, uh, and uh, then uh, uh, I came back and Deborah said, we got, you know, it's going into the New Yorker. And now we're going to do the whole book for publication. And so, uh, so I got this break. Now, I, I had met actually Grossman um, uh, not a few months earlier. He had, uh, I'd gone to, uh, briefly gone to a creative writing workshop in Hebrew because I wanted to start writing in Hebrew. And he was the, uh, he was the, um, the teacher. Um, but I stopped after two or three. I realized that I wasn't up to that yet. Um, but um, he wasn't famous yet. His, his, his break, breakthrough novel, See, See Under Love, had uh, just come out in Hebrew, uh, along with uh, The Yellow Wind. And so I just had this lucky break where it was a book that made a big stir. The translation was apparently OK. <laughs> apparently OK. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, um, then of course, I had a name, and I had a connection, and more stuff started coming in. So. Oh, that's, it's interesting how it does seem that for many of the people I've spoken with, um, Good fortune and happens chance plays quite a role in the development or evolution of a career. Um, let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of translation. What's your typical approach to translating a book or working on a text? Um, so a translation is, um, first place, it's above all, it's a careful reading of a text. Uh, there's no reading like reading what when you're translating, because you really have to understand every word and every sentence. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and it's gonna be a more thorough reading than most people ever read uh, of the book other than the author. Um, I've, uh, I've developed some techniques over the years, that's some of which I think other translators will 
say are controversial or everything, but I, I decided early on that it's actually not a good idea to read the uh, to read the manuscript before I translate it. I think that's especially true with nonfiction. That's not true. When I do translate fiction, I do read the. the it's important to get a sense of the the whole structure of the work and everything. But my theory is that is that um, a reader who reads a nonfiction book is um, going to be encountering it as he reads. And if there's something that's puzzling, if there's something that doesn't make sense, if there's something that isn't explained, it doesn't matter whether it gets explained later in the book. Uh, if the reader is gonna be puzzled, uh, he's more than likely to put down the book at that point or, or, or simply to skip over it and then get more and more confused as he goes on. And I, um, I feel like I need to encounter the text the same way the reader does. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, uh, and I need to understand each uh, each sentence and each paragraph and each chapter, um, and and to make it comprehensible to the to the reader. Scholar, in particular, when I'm working with with academic uh, scholars, um, you know, there's a certain jargon that they use when they're talking with other people in the field, and mm -hmm. often they don't realize um, that people from outside the field aren't gonna understand that. Right. Or they address issues that seem important to them, but readers will be clueless unless you explain to them why it's, in, why, why it's an important question. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so my main point in translating a nonfiction work is usually simply to understand what the author wants to say and to try to say it in the best possible way. Um, and so sometimes I'm also, um, I, I'm also uh, doing rewrite. I'm, I'm actually acting as an editor as I translate. And um, uh, I, um, I often make, I, the, the first draft that my clients get from me is marked up with all sorts of marginal comments and questions and, and suggestions uh, that they need to go through and they need to uh, uh, consider. Yeah. And the idea is to produce a, produce a, a, a book that's going to be readable and informative in English. And my, my general rule, my rule of thumb is that, is that a, even an academic book about a relatively obscure subject should be accessible to an interested undergraduate. That's my, that's my standard. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it, and sometimes I even get involved in, in the actual in the actual run of the argument, the logic of the argument. Sometimes I find things that seem to me not to be adequately explained or argued. Um, and that's always fun. It's always fun to work with an author mm -hmm. uh, who's a specialist. And I'm sort of a dilettante. I know a lot about, I know a little bit about a lot of things, uh, but not any particular subject in depth. Right, right, I see. Oh, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, just to remind us of your audience, if you have any questions at all that you'd like to ask Heim, please put them in the chat facility and I will pick a few at the end of our chat, so um, time about it. Um, I'm interested that you mentioned the um, positioning of a translator often as an editor as well, because um, I read this a few years ago, it's um, um, Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, and I was quite surprised to note that you're credited as its editor. Could you tell us a little bit about that, how that came about and what's it, how it worked? Okay, so um, uh, Yuval, Sapi, uh, Yuval Noah Harari's, uh, the book that's called Sapiens in English, is called uh, in Hebrew, Kitsur Toldot and Oshut, Short History of Mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a bestseller here uh, uh, a couple years before, three, three years before it came out in English. I think it might still be on the bestseller list for all I know. I don't know. Well, possibly, yes. <laughs> it was a tremendous success, and my kids were reading it. Um, and in particular, my older son was very enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it opened up uh, a world he didn't know that I was kind of surprised that he hadn't learned about in school. But um, uh, uh, and then uh, um, and then I got a, a call from Yuval Harari and. <laughs> He said, listen, I, I have this book uh, and I, um, I, I decided to translate it into English myself. He had an English translation and he had actually put it up on his website. You could download it for free. Huh. And, he, uh, and he said, but um, 
I, I've decided that maybe it is better to get a publisher in the end. And um, he, uh, he uh, said that people had told him that the, that the English was okay, but it lacked pizzazz. It wasn't particularly readable. And uh, he sent me, he sent me the first chapter and I looked at it and I did a few pages where I marked it up with so much red ink that um, I was sure that he was going to uh, be offended. I, I just made it lighter and funnier and, and, and rearranged things and, um, and put in more, I don't know, just, just made it more readable. And he, um, he was alarmed, but he showed it, he said, so he told me afterwards, he said, I showed it to uh, several other people and they all told him that that's exactly what the book needs. Um, huh. I took his English manuscript and I just rewrote it, and it was a fascinating uh, project. He was he was he was a it was a very nice collaboration. He and we had lots of arguments because we have it was material I know because I uh, among other things I worked as a science uh, writer, yes. and so I knew a lot of the a lot of the material at least in a basic way, and I could actually have arguments with him about his interpretations of things, um, and we often didn't agree. And of course it was his interpretation that counts that was what's going to go into the, into the book. Uh -huh. but, um, but it was a really nice process and, uh, and it came out um, uh, uh, and was a, was a big success. Uh, so yes, it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, so um, I've also edited books that are already in English and not, not just translated. Right. Um, your working relationship with Noah Harari is that typical of your work with your clients, as in very close, very engaged, very, very um, discourse-based relationship, or is it more from the hands-off sort of engagement? Uh, no, it's in, in almost all cases, uh, it's very respectful and it's very collaborative. It's not, it's a lot of work for, for the writers also because uh, they have to be involved. They have to answer my questions. They have to go over for chapters multiple times until we until we reach a version that we're all happy with. Right. Um, and uh, 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 it's um, it's it's so it's usually that way. It's it's and and I, I should say that most of my communication with my clients is by email. I, I in fact many of them I never I have still not met after many many years. I've not met in person. I'm not a phone person. I don't like working on the phone. I like emails and I and um, it's it's much easier to solve a problem uh, when I'm working on my own and not when I'm talking to someone on the phone uh -huh. so that's how I prefer to work but um, right um, across 30 odd years working in the Hebrew translation field how was the profession and how has the industry at large changed um, in the sense that I mean, I'm thinking about what sort of books get translated today as opposed to 30 or 40 years ago? Um, has the style of writing changed? Um, is the industry bigger or smaller? Well, the industry is smaller and the money is harder to come by. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Publishing is, is, is in crisis. And, and um, uh, uh, I mean, one of the advantages of being a nonfiction translation and working translator and working with academics is that relatively, I, I'm untouched by the crisis because academics have to get books published for their careers. They can't get tenure if they have books published. So, uh, and they have research funds to pay for that. So, so uh, I'm in relatively uh, better position than, than, uh, than translators of fiction in that sense. Um, of course, the internet has made a big difference. Uh, um, it's much easier for me to check facts uh, which I do uh, to, uh, uh, for, for, I mean, just for example, um, Wikipedia is, you know, it's not, a, it's not an authoritative source of information, but it's incredibly useful for my kind of work because if an author makes a statement that sounds, it, it strikes me as different from what I've heard, okay, or, or, or it doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, I can go to Wikipedia or some other similar source and just read up for a few minutes on, on the subject. And if, it, if it's different, and if the author is saying something different, then of course the author 
it's it's the author who's the authority, not Wikipedia. But yeah. often it's important to flag that for the reader. It's important to flag for the reader that the author is saying something different that differs from the conventional wisdom. Uh, um, because otherwise the reader might just say, oh, the author didn't read Wikipedia. What's he talking, what does he know? You know what's <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I mean, do, you do, do you have to, or do you choose to do background research before you start to work on a particular book to give you a sense of the world that the book is trying to recreate? And I ask that, keep it, keeping in mind what you just said about the state of the industry and the fact it's contracted, and I imagine that means that remuneration is not quite what it could be or should be. Well, none of us make as much money as we think we deserve, right? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Um, and look, I, right now I'm after, after decades in the field, I've developed a reputation and I have more work than I can possibly handle. And I'm also have, my kids are out of the house. So I have fewer expenses. So, you know, I'm not in this, but when I was younger and less known and had more expenses, then, then it wasn't easy. It's not a way to get rich, uh, translation. Um, and, uh, and I'll say another thing is it requires a lot of intensive self-disciplined work. Okay. And that's another reason why I don't want to go to meetings with authors if, uh, unless there's some good reason to do so, because I need to, it's like the red queen. I need to run as fast as I can and work as hard as I can to, to, to make ends meet. Uh, so I need the, I need my hours of work and I need to be focused, uh, on, uh, on what I'm doing. Um, the, the, the um, the academic book market has changed in the sense that even academic publishers are more concerned about their bottom lines, and they want books that will not just uh, go on a shelf in a library and be read. They want they want books like I I want books that will be accessible to they'll be available they'll be accessible for undergraduate courses uh, if professors want that's in fact that's one of the things that academic publishers look for now is you need to say this is something that will be good for a course in x um otherwise they won't they won't publish it because um, markets yes yeah and um uh and it means making the book um interesting and you know from the very first sentence you know the, the joke about academic books is that you know people read the introduction and the conclusions and never anything in between but you want a book that if a, if a person picks it up and reads the introduction, it's compelling enough that they want to go on and read the whole thing. That's yes. it. Mm -hmm. um, the flip side is, have you ever had the opportunity to work on a passion project, which is say a book that you felt ought to be shared with a wider English-speaking audience, and have you had a chance to push it through? Or conversely, would you like to have the opportunity to do that? Uh, there's only one case in which I've actually initiated or been involved in initiating a project. That was Hillel Cohen's, uh, the book that's called in English, uh, Year Zero of the, oh, yeah. 1929. Mm -hmm. It was a book I read, uh, I had worked with Hillel on a couple of books before. And when the book came out, uh, it's about the, the massacres that began in Hebron and spread all over the country in 1929. And because yes. I'd, I'd been, as I already said, I'd been done uh, reserve duty several times in Hebron, and I was very interested in the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, Hillel is an amazing scholar who sort of breaks down the boundaries and doesn't doesn't uh, uh, breaks down the conventional wisdom on both sides. And it's an amazing book. It's uh, it's I think it's one of the most important books published on the conflict in in recent years, uh, and uh, uh, where he simply takes the narratives on both sides and and just shows how each narrative developed. Um, in, in that case, I, I called him up and I said, Hillel, I want to translate this book. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, no one, in, no one outside Israel is going to really be interested in it. And, um, and then I got a, uh, an email from, uh, uh, from Brandeis University Press. Um, and they said, have you heard about this book by Hillel Cohen? And I said, yes, you should, you have to publish it and I'm going to translate it. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that was the only time that that happened, uh, actually. So. Ah, well, that's um, quite a heartwarming story in its own right, I think. Um, we've talked a lot about your work as a translator of nonfiction. I'm actually quite interested about talking about your experience of being translated yourself. Now, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have written, I believe, 150 necessary stories 
could you tell us a little bit about them and the fact that they're now being translated into Hebrew? Uh, so I, after I wrote my second book, um, A Crack on the Earth, I got approached by um, the Jerusalem Report, um, by, um, uh, uh, by, the, by the new editor, Ika, and, she, and um, Ita, and she... Uh, Ita Gibson, yes. Ita Price Gibson, yes. Yeah. And she uh, offered me a column, and uh, I accepted, excuse me, and um, and she wanted sort of a personal essay kind of thing, and I kept pushing it into fiction uh, mm -hmm. against her resistance. And uh, but eventually I won out, and um, and I started publishing a short story uh, every four weeks in the Jerusalem Report. Um, and it was really it was what I wanted to do because after writing two nonfiction books, I was really more interested in narrative and in storytelling than in going and doing research for another another nonfiction book. Uh -huh. It gave me an outlet. And again, being a journalist son and being a journalist myself, I never write better than when I'm under a deadline. Uh, and having to produce a story every four weeks on like clockwork was for me was just like, um, it was like drugs, you know, it was like, it was like just the, the best possible thing for me. And I produced one story. And of course, when you do that, occasionally there's a dud, but I think most of them are very good. Mm -hmm. And um, it also gave me an audience very different from uh, the usual literary audience. Usually today, people write short stories and they get published in literary magazines and they're read by other writers and people in MFA programs. And that's not where I was at and not the audience I was seeking. So what I got was readers who don't usually read short fiction, uh, but who were reading my stories. Yeah. And, uh, and then the, that was in the uh, Jerusalem Report for more than a decade and then, um, um that ended for that's another story but <laughs> but, uh, but then uh, the times of israel took it up for a couple of years and uh i wrote some more there and then now it's it stopped as of uh at the end of 2020 and i'm trying to figure out what uh where it goes next but actually what's being translated is not those stories but a play that i wrote based on one of the stories i do make a pardon yes that's correct mm -hmm. I, a play I wrote last summer, which was fun because actually I started out my writing career. I started out as a playwright when I was young, when I was a, at college and stuff. I wrote plays, and um, and I uh, uh, my stories tend to look like plays. They tend to have a single setting, and I sort of see them on stage. And this one seemed like to have a lot more material to plumb in it, so I took it and I. Uh, and I wrote a play and I started showing it around in English and I realized that um, it was very Israeli and very Jerusalem. It's a very Jerusalem play. Uh, and that probably it wasn't gonna interest uh, outside theater, theaters outside Israel as much as theaters inside Israel. But then the theaters here, the professional theaters said that they would only consider it if there was uh, a Hebrew translation. So uh -huh. after some debate, I approached um, Dori Parnas, who's one of the one of the most important translators of drama uh, into Hebrew mm -hmm. and to translate it. And uh, we finished that, uh, that collaboration just a few weeks ago. It was, uh, right. it was, it was, it was very daunting, uh, but he was very nice to me and very uh, helpful, just as I hope I am with, uh, with my clients. And now I'm sending it out to Hebrew theaters and we'll see what happens. Um, um, and what, just one interesting thing that came out of that was um, when I got the, the draft from him, I, uh, I said, um, I said, I said, Dory, you're, you're making my characters sound like they're American immigrants to Israel. They're talking like American immigrants. They're, they're, there's, there's certain words that, that, at least in my mind, they sound like direct translations from English and right. zit. And, uh, uh, and so, so, and he said, no, you're, that's not, this is the way Israelis talk. And I said, you know, I trust your ear more than I trust my own. Mm -hmm. Apparently I've been hyper-correcting all these times, you know, being so worried about sounding American that I've been avoiding these words uh, because I thought they would brand me as an American. You might have been able to save yourself a bit of work. How do you keep your knowledge of the two worlds working current and up to date? Because as you say now, having a sense of a 
tenor of interpretation of language is an important part of your work, I imagine. Uh, yeah, well, I read a lot. I, I probably don't watch as much television as I should. In fact, I hardly watch any. That's probably not good because that's where, that's where the action is now. But, um, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, but yeah, and uh, I read a lot. I, I, uh, I, and I think I, I read. I try to be. You asked before whether I read other works in advance of translating, and and that's right. also part of what I do is I try to keep current with what's going on in the in the scholarly community and in the uh, in the public discourse. So, right. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go to a chat for Satan now to look at a few questions I've popped in whilst we've been chatting. Um, now, Toby often asks, how long did it take to translate Sapiens? It was a fantastic work, and I now understand that part of its flavor belongs to you. Well, you didn't quite translate it. You edited um, your vast text, as you've said, but how long did it take you to work on it? Um, it was about four or five months. It was a very rushed job. Uh, it was, it was, it, the publishers wanted it quickly, and and uh, and I had other obligations. Uh -huh. so I've done it very intensely and very uh, uh, over over several months. Um, so, so right, okay. And did you have any inkling of the worldwide success that it was going to become? I mean, it was a big hit in Israel already, but um, I think its success is pretty much unprecedented for an Israeli nonfiction writer. No, I, no one knows. No one knew then. Uh, whether it was going to take off or not. And just as uh, Nadav Ayal's book, which is the last major work of mine that got published, which uh, we were all hoping and I think deserves to be a bestseller, uh, is not um, getting as much attention as it deserves, unfortunately. And there's no way, no way of knowing. A bit of a lottery, right. Um, Hila Bar, Hila, I beg your pardon, Hila Bar asks, coming from an English speaker's perspective, and knowing that the Hebrew vocabulary is more limited, but still, why is the repetition of words in Hebrew considered acceptable? You know, I don't know. It's just one of those things that develops. And um, I, I, I don't think it's because Hebrew has fewer words available. It's, it's, it's just one of those aesthetic traditions that have developed. Um, uh, you know, I'm reading, it's interesting because I'm reading some medieval Hebrew poetry now, and 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 then it, back then it was considered not only acceptable but good style to um, to rhyme with what we call in today in Hebrew easy rhymes, you know, with im with the plural suffix at the end, because and today that's considered sort of sort of um, juvenile because it's just so easy to do, you know. Uh, but back then it was considered fine style. These are just stylistic conventions that come and go. Um, and that's the way it is in Hebrew, I think, with repeating words. It's... Mm -hmm. um, a question from Maya. Should the translator aspire to transparency or invisibility? Um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, main point, the main point is to get the author's uh, voice out, out there or the author's content mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but sometimes there's a there's a need to um, in general with the kind of work I do you don't want the work to sound translated you want it to sound like it's you want it to sound like it was written in English originally yeah but when you're translating something else like a poem uh, or say an ancient text. I mean, I work with authors who are alive. I can consult with them, you know, but uh -huh. if you're translating an ancient text or, or a medieval text, um, then you don't have, you, first place, you don't have access to the author. And second, you need to preserve some, some of the flavor uh, of, the, of the original, and then it might sound stranger in English. But those aren't issues I generally deal with on a day-to-day on a, a -day basis. So. Right, right. Would you consider translating, would you have I mean, being at the beginning of a career, consider translating fiction as opposed to nonfiction on a more regular basis. You have, of course, translated short stories by Amos Oz and other writers, but um, on a more fixed basis, working on fiction rather than nonfiction. Um, the fact that I don't translate fiction isn't my choice. It's just sort of the way things happen. I develop uh -huh. a reputation in a certain direction. 
Um, I did translate two novels early on and they never got published. They never took off for, what, for whatever reason. So that sort of fixed my, fixed my direction. But, Introductions, right, so. okay. Mm -hmm. um, question from Karen Sethil. In terms of the relationship of the author, do you think it would make a difference if you were translating their work into a language of which we had no knowledge themselves, e.g. Chinese? We just see you're leading them blind, basically. They have to put all their trust in you. I'm not, I'm not sure I understood the question. How would I translate into a language I don't if, know? Let's assume you're working with an author who had no knowledge of English. Would it yeah. change your relationship with them? In a uh, sense, most Israelis do from, have, at the very least, functional English, and some have a very sophisticated knowledge of English, including some of your clients, I imagine. So in that sense... Right, if, no, that makes a big difference. There's, there, there is a range of knowledge of English. Um, mm -hmm. Most Israelis, Israeli academics in particular, know English pretty well. Yeah. Um, but occasionally, occasionally not. And occasionally um, I work with an author who's, who has to trust me and we have to deal with that. We have to, um, but I've, I very seldom translated works by authors who are not available to me. And that, that makes a big difference, obviously. One form of the other, absolutely. Um, Jochved Engelberg Cohen's asked a rather interesting question. I'm not quite sure that there's an answer, but I'll ask him for this. It sounds like you do a lot of back and forth with your authors. Do you charge by the page or do you have an hourly rate or some combination? I charge by uh, the number of words, a word count, right? And that includes all this other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And is it, agreed, is it agreed in advance or on submission? Or do you... No, no, no. no. <laughs> learn, learn the hard way that you need to sign a contract, you need to make the term very clear. It's, uh... Right, right, I see. Mm, okay. Um, after such an intensive process... Sorry, this is a question from Carmen Newman. After such an intensive process with the author, does a book usually go through an additional editor? I wouldn't have thought there's a finance at all that, but I don't know. Okay, so any, any self-respecting publisher has its editors who go over the manuscript, but publishers like working with me because I give them a manuscript that needs very little work afterwards. Right. And uh, the, the, the changes after I submit a manuscript tend to be very, very minor. Um, uh, uh, but there is an editor who, who goes over it and uh, who sees my work. And I need, one of the things I try to do is I try to give, uh, you know, there's no sense in working with an author on a translation that's just gonna get torn apart by an editor at the publishing house. So I always tell my authors, I say, we need to solve these problems here between us uh, because you don't, you, you wanna have control. You don't wanna, you don't want it to, the, your manuscript to get totally- um, uh, Who not? That's a later point in time. Does this say something about the Israeli publishing industry as opposed to the publishing industry in the United States or the United Kingdom? I mean, I know in Israel, the literary agents are not very much of a thing, except for work in translation. And I do know that some publishing houses don't necessarily have the same sort of editorial structure before a book's published originally. Do you think that reflects in the amount of work you do as a translator? Yeah, I, I well, I wrote an article about this for the Tel Aviv of Books. Uh, you did, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that I mean Israeli publishers do have editing staffs, and they have editors who are uh, famous, some of them, and everything. I personally think that the editors are uh, both of, for fiction and nonfiction tend to be uh, don't tend to uh, uh, work hard enough to on the manuscripts. I think books come out in both fiction and nonfiction that are just way longer than they have, than they should be. Um, uh, PhD theses get published as books with almost no changes and they're unreadable. I just, uh, I, I don't know why that's the case, but that's that's the way it is. It is what it is, I suppose. Right. Um, Fabio Shaw asks, would you feel able to translate academic works in English into Ivrit, into Hebrew? No. I, I, I don't have the stylistic facility in Hebrew. And most annoyingly, as I make just stupid mistakes that I, I mean, I, that would stand out on me would, you know, that I would see in English, uh, uh, but I just don't see them in Hebrew. So mm -hmm. I, when I read in Hebrew, I need someone to go over it. Yeah. 
right? And so to be clear, evidence here, the point here is that the vast majority of translators translate in one direction because they translate from their native or more comfortable language into the second language. Right. Um, Jacob Malky asks, well, he says, I find rhetorical texts are more difficult to digest. Is it more difficult to translate such texts? Which I think touches on what we've said already about um, the rhetorical the language style in writing in Hebrew as much as the content. Um, what was the first, the, the, what kind of texts were? Rhetorical texts, as opposed to factual texts, I suppose, are difficult to try to digest. Is it more difficult to translate such texts? No, I wouldn't say it's more difficult. It's it's a different. It requires different, you know, a different sort of attention, a different sort of uh, uh, skill set. But uh, I don't think it's fundamentally different. Hmm. Um, question here from Ruth Sack: Do you confine yourself to particular academic fields? or can you translate in all stroke any fields? Um, most of the work I do is in the social sciences and history, uh, law. Um, I have translated other things. I've translated some philosophical texts. I, I'm a, I like reading philosophy. I'm a, sort of a hobby. Uh -huh. uh, and I like doing that kind of work, but it's obviously much more difficult. They're the, they're, they're the issue of, of the, the um, the jargon and the you know the in-house uh, words and vocabulary and terms is much more serious. Um, I've even occasionally done some scientific stuff. As I said, I was a science reporter, so I do have some knowledge of the natural sciences. Mm. I've done uh, a few things like that. Uh, things I don't understand at all are sports <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, engineering and mm -hmm. uh, computer science. Right. So the starting point is that you have to have some sort of engagement with the subject matter to feel confident to work on the text. Um, Ayala Adler asks, and I might be missing something, I'm not quite sure. How does translating Agnon work? I would never try to translate Agnon. I, <laughs> I mean, I, people do it and I, I've never quite figured out. I mean, I guess you do it because you really like Agnon and you want people to get it in English, but the, 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 there are a few authors, Agnon and Chaim Be'er, who I really like, who um, um, the, the, whole, the whole pleasure of reading them is just the, 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 the texture of the Hebrew prose and the, and the references and, um, and the, the, the connection with, with, uh, with Hebrew literature, uh, ancient Hebrew literature and texts. And I just don't, I, you know, if, read it, read I've known in Hebrew if you want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, without necessarily wanting to suggest that you're favoring one or more clients over others, what's the book you've derived most pleasure from translating? That's a hard one because I, I, um, I, I enjoy almost all of them in one way or another. I think I get a lot of gratification from helping young scholars get their um, get their works out and their ideas out. And um, I think contrary maybe to public opinion or to common wisdom, there's actually a lot of interesting work being done by, uh, by young scholars who were sort of on the cusp of tenure, um, just before or just after, um, people who are um, sort of a third generation. If we had the generation of scholars that was supporting the Zionist narrative and then the, the subsequent generation like Tom Segev who were got access to archives and started breaking down those myths. Now we have a, a young third generation that is, that is sort of rejecting both those narratives and finding um, um, uh, new ways of, of parsing facts and comparing facts and telling stories and new sources of information, social history, you know, more, more work from the bottom up rather than uh, uh, with official texts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm doing a, a lot of interesting work with, um, with uh, scholars who were uh, one, Tal El Melia, whose uh, subject is the Israeli left, who's just doing really, really interesting and original work. Uh, Nir Kedar, who is a- uh, Yes, it's an excellent book, it is. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Uh, really, uh, really a, a book that for me, uh, even though I know a lot of Israeli history, completely put things into a new light. Um, and uh, uh, Hillel Cohen, I already mentioned, uh, uh, Tuvia Freeling's book on, um, on uh, uh, what's it called? Um, anyway, uh, working on how narratives get um, uh, uh, shaped, shaped, and how narratives get shaped, and how uh, the truth is more elusive than maybe either of the two previous administrate uh, uh, generations realized. Um, hmm. Hmm. Would you have liked to have been an academic yourself? No, no, <laughs> a very certain no. <laughs> I, I, my interests are too broad. I can't specialize. In, uh, All right, okay. Um, this is actually a question for me from Nemi Schachter. Um, Schachter, I beg your pardon. I can do, do translations, most certainly not. <laughs> and if so, what kind of books do you like to translate? No, I'm afraid not. I'm a reader. My Hebrew is nowhere near strong enough to do translations. And um, like many people who grew up in the part of the world I grew up in, I'm a determined monoglot to my shame. And I should say that actually, um, a lot of my education about Israel before I moved there is thanks to Chaim's wonderful translations of Tom Segev, of Igor Sana, of David Grossman, and of many, many other writers. Um, Chaim, you've been incredibly generous with your time this evening. It's been a fascinating conversation, and I'd like to thank you for taking our questions. Um, in a moment, um, Aviv is going to put on the microphone so everyone can thank you personally for sharing your um, your wealth of knowledge from 30 years of translation with all of us. But before I do, before she does that, first of all, I'd like to thank Aviva herself and Olga Lempert of the National Library of Israel for their support in putting together this evening's event and indeed the whole series of the art of translation. And I'd like to thank the audience for being engaged, interesting, committed and participatory audience. And of course, again, Chaim, I'd like to thank you very, very much for your time and for your generosity with your knowledge this evening. Um, the series continues. We've got two more, one with Professor Yuda Shenhav of Tel Aviv University about translating Hebrew, um, Arabic into Hebrew. And the final event will be with Jessica Cohen, the International Man Booker Prize winning translator of many of Israelis leading contemporary novelists. In the meantime, Chaim, thank you very much. And Aviva, if you'd like to put the microphone on so everyone can say thank you and do have a good week. Shavuot Tov. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Those were some really colorful stories there. <laughs> Full of serendipity. <laughs> thank you. But, uh, you know, it takes a lot of strength to decide, yeah, I'm going to take that path. I'm going to run with this. Thank you, Haim. And Akin, as per always, always fascinating and very interesting. Thank you very much. Hi, Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kiva, I see also Akiva Roth, who's a uh just coming into the field now and uh oh. i had some contact with uh, yeah uh i'm really uh it was fascinating and I'm, I'm also doing some translating now from uh from english to hebrew so uh yeah. common is uh is one of those people who can go both ways uh and uh does a very good job i'm illiterate in both languages so. <laughs> good to know um, so it's just cut across very quickly. M3 just asked where the previous interviews in the series are. They will be on the National Library of Israel's website in the next couple of weeks. If you look under events, you'll be able to find them. Yeah, uh, I think that there are only maybe five people in it. Wait, you, you muted yourself, uh, Judith. I think that there are only maybe five people in Israel who are professional enough to translate in both directions. It's extremely rare. And anybody who says they do, and anybody who says they translate everything is a charlatan. <laughs> and this is from many years of translating. Only into my native language, which is American English. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Judy. <laughs> And with that, I think we can call it tonight. So Viva, you can shut the room now. And Chaim, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much.